Hey, it's Clay. Welcome to another video. This is going to be the start of a new AMP project build. I was contacted by a friend, family member of mine, who is also a great guitar player and interested in tube amps, and he has an old Hammond organ that he is interested in converting. Having done two of these now, uh, I, th I think this could be a pretty neat little project. Um, so let I, what I want to do in this video is kind of talk about the planning stages. So a lot of this actually is going to be directed to my friend, but I think this is interesting content to help shed light on some of the design process, or if you're thinking about converting a Hammond amp into a guitar amp, what you, some of the considerations you should make, or just in general, if you're interested in designing and building your own amplifier, hopefully some of this discussion will be relevant to any tube amp project. So uh, let's go ahead and start off and dive into what we can find out and see if we can make a cool little amp project out of this organ. Okay, so to begin, I want to talk about, because we're using a Hammond organ amp, what some of our considerations are. Now, first and foremost, you should know that Hammond organs can, the amplifiers in them are very complicated or complex. And so what you're looking at here is really probably just one piece or section of, uh, of the amp as a whole. These amps tend to have a lot of different sections. In fact, if we look up a uh, schematic, you, know, you can see these things are very, very uh, detailed and thorough things. Um, they are pretty massive. Let's see if I can actually find one here. Okay, so this is actually a schematic for the L100 AO41. Now, I believe the amp that I was shown, it does say L100, but I don't... There's some kind of AO, which I actually don't know exactly what it is yet. Maybe, maybe it's... Here, I guess I'm not 100% sure what the marking is, but um, just to give you an idea, this is the AO41, which I think is similar to this, but this is the amp as a whole. And as you can see, this thing is very complicated and complex. You've got a power supply down here. I believe this is the output section. Then there's a reverb amplifier. There's a vibrato phase ship amplifier. There's a percussion amplifier. There's a tremolo oscillator. Um, preamplifier these things are pretty massive and it's actually as you can see split into three different chassis so we're just dealing with one which I believe is the reverb and power amplifier and actually if you look at this layout this is kind of why I think this is maybe similar to what we've got but it's hard to know for sure but um, that doesn't necessarily matter because in my opinion if you're going to convert this to a guitar amp you should probably be to some extent deciding on what you want to keep versus what you want to uh, pull out. So I'm going to give you my guidance and advice on what I think is best to keep versus to pull out. Um, and by that what I mean is on the simplest level you could probably find a way to um, put a quarter inch input and then run it into the circuit, um, in, into all of this circuitry, and then have it come out of a speaker, and you would probably get some functional amplification. But, because we're converting it into a guitar amp, we probably don't want to do that for best tone and usability, and also, these things are like 50, 60 years old sometimes, so a lot of the internal circuitry is maybe prone to error. Uh, or degradation over time. So let's talk about what I see. Uh, first of all, you've got a really nice steel chassis. These chassis are old and they got some nice patina, but a chassis is just a chunk of steel and unless it's really heavily rusted, uh, it's going to be perfectly fine. And a chassis is one of the more expensive components in an amplifier, so it's really nice to be able to get a chassis. This is a nice size chassis. It's, it's a little bit on the medium to smaller side, but it will certainly work for this purpose. So definitely I think we should reuse the chassis. One issue though is it's going to have a lot of extra holes that maybe we aren't going to need or use. Like for example, a lot of this input stuff isn't exactly what we need. We may also need to drill some extra holes to fit what it doesn't accommodate. And then you may have some holes that are just left open. So at some point you want to make, consider like a face plate of some kind, but that's nothing that we can't handle. So there's just going to be some extra work involved with using a chassis like this. Um, second, um, let's talk about the next big things. It would be these two transformers. So this is your power transformer right here. This is your output transformer right here. And I would say that the, specifically the power transformer is definitely something that we want to consider re reusing. Uh, power transformer is probably the next 
piece after the chassis in terms of expenses. Uh, they're, they can be pretty expensive, um, up, upwards of over $100. And they also dictate a tremendous amount of what your circuit is going to look like. And these, in my experience, these Hammond uh, transformers are excellent and I have no concerns about them wearing down with time. I think they should work completely fine. Now, the output transformer, I also think, is going to be excellent. Uh, this is looking like a really nice output transformer. It's going to work well for our purpose. Uh, I have had some situations where the output transformer maybe wasn't suitable for the way I was converting the amp, but that was mostly because I was maybe um, taking it too far away from its original design. But for this, when we get into later, I think that, that there are more reasons, which I'll touch on in a second, why this is going to be a great fit. Next, some little bits and bobs like a pot, an IEC power cord, and a number of tube sockets. I think we should probably try to reuse them. Uh, they are more than likely going to be pretty good. There's also maybe a couple quarter-inch jacks that are going to be good. Um, these these Tube sockets probably could use some cleaning, which is something we can do, but that's not a problem. But, you know, these, these little bits and bobs, I think, should do a nice job of getting us on our way. So, it, in my opinion, those are the things that we should consider keeping. The things that we should probably rip out, in my opinion, would be like these filter capacitors. Now, I don't exactly know what this is. It may be a choke. May be able to use it. Maybe not. Um... And then, basically, if you were to flip this around and look inside the amp, it's going to have a bunch of circuit boards that have a bunch of resistors and capacitors. And in my opinion, we should be ripping those out entirely. Um, the resistors might be fine, but I, my experience with these are carbon comp resistors, and they are probably drifted um, out of spec by kind of a lot. And the filter capacitors are likely too old and going to need to be changed and replaced anyways. So my opinion is we should just scratch all of that and just build a circuit inside. So um, amongst that left over, there really isn't, I mean, other than the resistors, the capacitors, we're probably going to need to decide on a construction method. Are we going to use a PCB? Are we going to use point to point, something else like that? Um, that's up to the builder. And then, um, you know, really other than that, there aren't a lot of expenses left. Uh, so I think we should be doing a pretty good job of getting a lot of this put together. So um, again, to reiterate, let's keep the, the chassis, the transformers, and some of these other little components and the, the tube sockets. And then let's rip everything else and start from scratch. So next, within those parameters, let's take a look and try to figure out what kind of circuit we want to implement into this amp. Uh, obviously with guitar amps, there are a million different types of circuits that you can choose from, but I'm going to recommend that we keep it a little bit close to the vest, uh, in certain parts of the circuit. So specifically the power supply and the power section, um, on this top image, you can see the layout of the tube sockets, and this is really going to help us with our design choices. We see a 5U4 rectifier. We see two 6BQ5, which are EL84 power tubes. And we've got two 12AX7s, and I don't exactly know what this is. Uh, but this tube complement here is excellent because a 5U4 rectifier into two 6BQ5s is very much in line with what you would want for a power section for a guitar amp. Uh, you know, sticking with the 5U4 rectifier is going to ensure that this power transformer was designed to have its voltage dropped by that amount to feed. The, these two power tubes and I think we can expect that our voltages are going to be good and the power transformer is going to work well to feed that kind of power supply. Um, with those three components, right, that's how you're going to dictate you primarily your plate voltage and also the current that's going to be running through the amp. And, you know, for example, if you were going to try to use EL34s instead, you're going to need higher plate voltage and more current than maybe what is able to be supplied here. So it will just be easiest f for, for using these two transformers if we just stick with what we've got right here, which is no problem because these components are already, there's a number of circuits that we can use and there's a number of design choices that we can make within that context. Okay, then we've got two 12AX7 tube sockets already installed. Um, we're gonna need some kind of phase inverter which is going to use either a half or a whole 12AX7, and then we're going to need some kind of preamp, which is going to use probably at least one 
12AX7. So um, we'll get more, touch on more of that later when we talk about the circuit. But I'm going to say within those limitations, let's reuse the chassis, the transformers, the tube sockets, some little edits and ends. Let's keep it with a 5U4 rectifier into two EL84 power tubes. It's going to give us about 15 watts push-pull. And from there, uh, though that's going to kind of lock us in in terms of the choices that are made for us with this type of project. Okay? So next, uh, we've talked about things to keep. Let's talk about what are the choices that need to be made next uh, to, to get this thing project moving forward. So really, basically, we need to be deciding on the type of circuit that we're going to use. And so, um, first up, you have the choice of what type of phase inverter you want to use. Now, I've listed two here, the cathodyne and the long tail pair. There are more types of phase inverters than what I've listed. However, these are the two that I'm experienced with and the two that I recommend, that I see the most. And so, let's talk on them a little bit. Um, because we're using two output tubes, they're going to be in push-pull, we need a phase inverter so that the preamp can communicate with the power amp. The preamp is going to have a kind of mono path, and then the power amp, because it's going into two, two output tubes, is going to need a stereo path. So the phase inverter helps us to do that correctly. Um, so the first is cathodyne. This is older. It's very simple. It's very basic. It's used in a 5E3 Tweed Deluxe. One of the advantages is that it only takes up one half of a 12AX7. So a 12AX7 preamp tube uh, is two gain stages wrapped in together. So uh, the cathodyne only needs half of the two, one of the two. Um, and because it only uses one triode, it, it makes it very simple, very clean, very straightforward. I would say it is probably most suited for cleaner or lower gain type amps uh, where you, I think it's going to perform best in those environments. Because if you are someone that really likes to push the power section of the amp into distortion, um, one theory that I have been chewing on is the idea that when people say power amp distortion, certainly there is some extent where the power tubes, in this case EL84s, are being pushed into distortion. But I also think that a big part of that sound is the sound of the phase inverter. When the phase inverter gets pushed into distortion, and because the cathodyne only has a half of a tube, one gain stage, uh, it doesn't work as well with higher gain. And so if you push it into high volumes in a distortion, it can start acting kind of strangely and it can provide some blocking distortion and it can be just a little bit unruly. Um, you know, if you think about those 5 3 Tweed Deluxes, they have a tremendous grind and character to them. But then if you really push them like to 10 on their volume control and you hit them with a boost, it can start getting like a little bit um, over the top, a little bit unruly. Um, so then on the other side, the long tail pair, I would say this is probably the most popular amongst classic amp circuits. It's used on a lot of circuits like blackface fenders, like the deluxe reverb or twin reverb. It's used in almost every Marshall circuit from Plexi to JTM 45 to a JCM 800 to, to modern, uh, most modern higher gain amps are going to use this type of amp. Most, um, I believe most Vox style amps or, or matchless style amps are going to use this. Um, the main difference is it's going to use two triodes, so it uses two gain stages, the whole 12AX7. But the nice part about it is it actually will, you know, the, the cathodyne phase inverter simply performs its job where it takes the signal, one, one mono signal, and it splits it into two out of phase stereo paths. But the long tail pair does that as well, but it also provides amplification, and it provides a gain boost. And so um, I would say that this is more flexible in that it sounds great clean, and it sounds great dirty. It is a little bit more complicated to wire up, whereas the cathodyne is dead simple to wire. And so it's also going to use more parts, um, more resistors, more capacitors, and there's more complexity there. If you want my honest opinion, I think the long tail pair is a really nice choice, and I kind of tend to think of it as the default, but I think the only reason why I maybe would recommend that you consider the cathodyne is if you are looking for more of a cleaner build, and because we've got two uh, 12AX7 slots, if you didn't want to drill another one, 
But if some of your preamp choices meant, you know, if you use cathodyne, you're, you're using half. So you've got one, two, three preamp gain stages to play around with. Whereas if you use the long tail pair, you're going to use this whole thing and you just have one, two gain stages to play around with. So when we get to the preamp section, I think that that should inform your decision with the type of phase inverter that you use. Next, I think you should be thinking about negative feedback. Negative feedback is, in my opinion, one of the critical decisions for the voicing of the amp. What it does is, uh, if we go back to our schematic, so um, you are taking... So right here, this is our speaker out on the, this, the secondary, the output side of the output transformer. And it's going to take some of this signal and it's going to send it back in. So it's sending it negatively. It's going to send it back and in, introduce it into the circuit. And when you do that, you are creating some phase cancellation. And so um, what it does is it reduces uh, the amount uh, of signal you've got so it's going to be lower gain. You're also going to be broadening the frequency range. So less mid-range, more lows and more highs, more balance across all of those for a little more hi-fi type sound. Um, you're going to have more headroom, more tame, more civilized. Um, you're going to decrease noise. And then the biggest thing too is you're going to be changing the way the amp distorts. So imagine if you take a tube amp and you go from maybe two or three on the volume control, very clean, up to maybe five. It's starting to get a little hairier, edge of distortion. You go up to six or seven and you're starting to get into classic rock territory, up to eight or nine or ten, and it's really pushing, right? That onset is going to be pretty gradual. Well, if you increase, introduce some negative feedback, the divide between clean and dirty becomes greater. So it'll stay cleaner a little longer. But then when it does go into distortion, it will go into distortion faster. So you maybe have less shades of gray and a slightly more of kind of a black and white type setup. Um, amps with no negative feedback, an example would be a Tweed Deluxe or some old Vox circuits or a Marshall 18 watt. Um, no negative feedback is very mid-focused and very gradual onset of distortion. Amps with negative feedback would include Deluxe Reverb, Plexi, and the big question here is that the amount of negative feedback used can vary a lot. So to sum this up, this is your choice. You could choose to have no negative feedback at all. You could choose to have a fixed amount of negative feedback. You could choose to put it on a switch and select predetermined levels of negative feedback. So for example, you could have a two-way switch that would either give you zero negative feedback or maybe a medium amount of negative feedback. Or you could have a switch that goes between low negative feedback and high negative feedback, or any in between. And then lastly, you could put it on a pot that would give you gradual selecting uh, very, you know, you could go from, from none to high and everywhere in between. So the other thought is that implementing negative feedback usually requires a little bit of tweaking to find the right balance. But I would say that having some control over this is a really cool option. Um, I've done amps with all of the above. I tend to prefer having at least a little bit of negative feedback, but I think that it, amps can sound great all over the place with all the above. And I also think that um, maybe putting it on a switch to go from no negative feedback to a, a moderate amount is probably, it's a good combination of very simple. You still get a very pure circuit, still simple and straightforward to wire up, but you still get a really nice you know, uh, level of, of controllability there, a very effective tone switch. So then um, we've talked, you need, you need to pick your phase inverter, you need to pick your negative feedback. Now we need to talk about preamp. The truth is with this project is you can choose to implement any type of preamp circuit that you want, given that you have the tube sockets. Now we've got two 12AX7s. Again, one of them, at least the whole or the half, is going to be used for your phase inverter. So you've got at least one. Now we could drill and add an additional one or maybe just reuse this, this one. Um, so you, you certainly can do that and I have done that a lot. Um, so I wouldn't necessarily limit myself to that if you don't want to because you can drill. But um, the type of preamp circuit that you're going to want to pick is going to 
dictate a lot of how many 12x7s you need. Um, also, just as kind of a general thought, I tend to like to use all of the gain stages in my 12x7s. So it always kind of bothers me if you have one that's unused, but um, that's just kind of a personal quirk. So thinking about your preamp tubes is probably a good place to start. The more preamp tubes that you have, the um, dirtier the, the preamp can get. Okay, so, um, you know, uh, the level of gain that you want to achieve is a big part of that. Also, if you want to have any tube-driven effects like reverb or tremolo, that is going to require a lot more 12AX7s. If you think about a deluxe reverb, it probably has like five or six 12AX7s. That's because it has both tube-driven reverb and tremolo and two channels. So this will add a lot of complexity to the circuitry, which may be harder to install into a small chassis like this. It's going to be difficult to do that. Um, I personally have come to the conclusion that they do sound really good. I especially think the tube-driven uh, spring reverb sounds really nice, but the pedals that we have also sound really nice, and I kind of like to keep my amps a little more straightforward. So that's just my preference would be to not add this. So next you need to think about what level of gain that you want in this amp. So the cleaner the amp, the less gain stages you need. More vintage style cleaner amps like Tweed Deluxe, AC15, Deluxe Reverb, Basement Plexi are going to use less gain stages. <coughs> so Deluxe Reverb has two gain stages into a paraphase phase inverter. Um, that's, I believe, you know, I may be confusing cathodyne and paraphase. So I apologize for that confusion. But the, the, nonetheless, two gain stages is probably as low as you want to go. I wouldn't do one. Uh, that just leads to a very, very low output and is difficult to drive. Maybe if you wanted to do one gain stage into a long tail pair, that could work. But those amps, I, th I, I would typically say two gain stages is really nice. Uh, you can also do three gain stages. Um, so... For example, uh, a JCM 800 is going to add an extra stage. A Dumble is actually going to add two more stages. Some of these Mesa style amps or Soldano or something like that can add three, four, or five even. Um, so the amount of gain that you want kind of helps us dial into that range. Next, what kind of preamp controls do you want? The amount of control that you have as a general rule, I would say, is the more that you add volume controls and tone controls and all these different kind of controls, Essentially, those things are all just taking away signal. So the more controls that you add, the lower gain that you have. So um, some options. Preamp volume is almost every single amp ever has at least some kind of preamp volume. Now, master volume. Some have more of a fixed where the master is basically preset at maximum, or you can put it on a pot. Um what kind of tone controls you want, right? There are some amps that have none, some that maybe have just a single tone control. But then if you're wanting to jump up and have like a two or three band EQ where you've got bass treble or bass mid treble, uh, those are going to suck out a lot of signal. So just by having those, those tone controls in the amp, you are losing a lot of your gain. So for example, the vibrato channel of a deluxe reverb it has three gain stages, which into a long tail pair phase invert, which is a, a quite a bit of gain. Could be a high gain amp if you would wire it up in just such a way. But because it has a very lossy three band EQ tone stack, it's got tube driven tremolo and reverb, and it's got moderate negative feedback, it ends up being a very clean amp. So there's a lot of give and take there. There are a lot of possibilities here, and we can do whatever you want. I would recommend you kind of think about amps that are your favorites and use that as a jumping off point. But I'm going to offer two basic solutions. One would be a simple volume and tone setup. Very basic, very effective, not as much signal loss, a little more of a pure signal, not a ton of tone shaping though. And specifically with the mid-range, uh, uh, this type of volume and tone setup usually gives you some control over bass and treble kind of in re relation to one another, but you don't get the ability to control your mid-range. And then the second would be a bass mid-treble tone stack. Now this, you could do bass treble and keep the mids fixed, or you could put all three on a pot. This has really good tone shaping and flexibility. It can really help you dial in different voices of the amp, and especially the types of values that you use, right? If you use a Marshall tone stack versus a Fender versus a Vox, 
it could really change the sound. And then also one thing I like to do is it's very easy to add what's called an EQ lift switch, which takes the tone stack out of the signal entirely with the flick of one switch and you get a big gain boost and you get more of that simple, straightforward, pure type tone. So in my opinion, that is kind of a really nice best of both worlds where you still get um, more of that mid-range pushed, raw, direct, pure signal with the tone stack lifted, or you can put it back in for more of a mid-scoop, maybe get a little better clean tone or get a little bit better control over your sound overall. And in that setup, the, the mid control could be a pot or a fixed value. Either one would be fine. And then lastly, I would think about, do you want to have multiple channels? So partly this is in relation to how much gain you want, right? If you just want one channel amp that's got one voicing, then you would obviously don't need as many tubes. But some amps have either multiple gain stages that are stacked into one another, like a JCM 800, where it's called uh, cascading. Again, you're, you're sending one into the next into the next in series. Or uh, you can also have two separate parallel paths. So an amp like a Plexi or a Basement or a Deluxe Reverb, you have two different EQ'd paths that are p running in parallel one another that join later on down the line. So for example, you could have a darker normal channel and then a brighter bright channel. And you can almost use the volume controls on those two channels as an EQ mix. Right, so so depending on how much uh, bass you want, you can kind of mix in the volume of the normal channel, or vice versa. And uh, that doesn't necessarily mean you have more gain, but you do have a little bit more flexibility in how you're using the voicings of those two parallel paths. So if you were to answer all of these questions, um, what kind of phase inverter do you want? Do you want what kind of negative feedback choices do you want and what kind of preamp do you want? That would really get us long ways down the road in deciding what kind of amp you want to build. So I will keep you guys posted on the decisions that Henry makes and I would love to hear your thoughts down below. What kind of dis design choices would you make and how would you think about it? If you have any questions or comments, please leave them down below. I'd love to hear from you guys. I'll see you again soon. Thanks. Bye.